This is Coogan Cassis for IFL TV in association with Mac the Knife Global. I'm joined by from the IBO, Ed Levine. How are you, sir? How are you today? Very well, thank you very much. Good to be in London. Good to, always. I've brought some Miami weather with me, <laughs> but it hasn't shown itself yet. Absolutely. Now, the most amazing thing I've learned today is that you're 74 years old. Oh, that's not amazing. <laughs> it's incredible. As oldies live longer these days. You don't days. look older than 72, honestly, Ed. Most people think it's 71, but 71. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about history here, because yes. 27 years ago, you were a supervisor um, for then the WBO. Yes. For the, fight, the first fight between Chris Eubank and Nigel Benn. Yes. And 27 that's... years on, you're a supervisor for the IBO for Chris Eubank Jr.'s fight with Reynold Quinlan. The interesting thing about that, it's both of their uh, first attempt at a world title. So it was Chris Eubank's first attempt at the world title, because Nigel Benn held it at that time, and uh, Junior is going after his first world title. Uh, I think Junior was just a baby when his father fought Nigel Benn. But as I've said over the years, when people ask me, what, what's the best fight you've ever seen, I always mention uh, Eubank Benn won, yeah. because it had all the ebb and flow that fans you know, a lot of fans, just like as they do today, came out to see Eubank lose because he stirs up that emotion, you know, and he's brash. And uh, that's good for boxing. It brings the people out. And I think his son is doing the same thing. And to me, it's an absolute deja vu moment uh, to see the son carry on where the father uh, started the same kind of track. And the other thing I, I was telling you earlier, I went into the dressing room, which I usually don't do after a fight like that, uh, just to congratulate Chris Eubank Sr. because he was such a warrior that night. Uh, I said, you know, this wasn't just about skill. It was about heart and being a warrior. And you have shown me something that I don't see too often. It was a wonderful night, and this is bringing back those memories. A wonderful time. Absolutely. Um, no one likes negativity, but yes. in boxing there's always negativity. Absolutely. So this is I want to just give me your chance to respond to this, Ed. Um, since the fight was announced, Chris Eubank Jr. has had um, some criticism about the IBO not being recognised as this real world title. What do you say to those people that would suggest that and are using that as a sort of a thing to sort of maybe downplay this fight this week? Well, I've heard that broken record for some years, obviously. Uh, if some of those people who have that negativity would look up and see the champions we've had in the past five, six years, not just five, past ten years, uh, it's, a, it's a who's who of marquee champions. Champions make titles. Titles don't make champions. Uh, we've had Lennox Lewis proudly defend our title. I'm not sure the number of times, but probably a half a dozen or more times. Uh, Vladimir Klitschko has defended our title 20 times. Gennady Golovkin has defended our title a dozen times. Uh, uh, I can, the list is... Mayweather, right. Pacquiao, the list goes on. Yeah, it yeah. goes on and on and on. Yeah. So uh, what I tell people is uh, they confuse sometimes the word respect and recognition. Uh, the building of the IBO is based upon integrity. Uh, rather than... Uh, there, are, there are better business plans for us to get more recognition, uh, but we've chosen a different path. Computerized ratings. Uh, if you want to see where a fighter is rated, uh, look at our ratings. Yeah, because they are not ratings based upon who does business with us. They're based upon uh, who the fighter has beaten, uh, his actual ratings. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, uh, Ask yourself, why do these great champions fight for the IBO title? Uh, they're managed by great people, they're tremendous managers, financial planners. Would they just be throwing their money away for a title that's meaningless? You know, it doesn't work that way. Uh, they know that uh, if we're involved, it's going to be a level playing field. Uh, we, uh, we are transparent. What we do is, is honest. We work with, with the best promoters around the world. And uh, we're here to stay. Uh, I get particularly guiled when they group us with some of the other lesser organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, they'll say, There's, here's the four, and the IBO and the others, and they'll mention three or four other alphabet names, but uh, there are no champions that you can mention. Mm -hmm. So uh, boxing is difficult enough with two, three, four, or five 
but to uh, just out of hand say the IBO is not mm-hmm. part of what is what we call a serious organization today is to me just ridiculous. How about, I mean, again, how would you address the, the other governing bodies, the four other governing bodies, we, we know what they are, um, failing to sort of accept uh, the IBO and one of their titles as a unification? I don't think that that's going to happen so quickly. <clears throat> if you have uh, any, first of all, they have an agreement amongst themselves. Mm. This is not a secret that the only unifications that they do are with the other three. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's actually a, an agreement that they have. And if you think about it, if you're in any business and you have a, a non-competitive edge, which they have, uh, any business, and, you, and there's four majors in that business, would you agree to bring in a fifth major when you don't have to? Yeah. So do I hold this against them? Not necessarily. If I was in that, in that position, maybe I would feel the same way. Uh, so having it formally called uh, a unification is really not a concern to me. Uh, if there are two titles or three titles or four titles, uh, in fact, it is a unification, whether it's labeled that by the other sanctioning bodies or not. And actually, some of those sanctioning bodies have been very cooperative with us. They will tell me, we're not going to call, we don't call this a unification, but they cooperate, and the fight is for two titles or three titles. So uh, we just go, we're just going with what is there for us now and uh, building a, a reputable sanctioning body. Never been in a lawsuit. Think about that. 15 years of sanctioning. That's body. a record. Not one. Yeah. Uh, and the reason is th- there's no, there's no, we don't do anything that would cause to have one. So we're just going with the best fighters. We've turned down a lot of fights over the years. People don't realize that, so it's just for the money. Uh, we could do twice as many world title fights every year that we don't do. Uh, because if the quality is not there, we won't do the fight. It's just that simple. The other thing that's hard to fathom by the typical fan, they say, well, how can you have a fighter who's ranked number 32 fight for your world title when every other organization has to be in the top 15? The simple reason is our rate- ratings are computerized. And... Uh, you can't get a rating by winning one of our junior titles. It doesn't make you number 11 yeah. in the world. So it's a different business for me. Well, Ed, listen, I appreciate you uh, nice answering these you. questions. Uh, it's interesting because it's, it's talks about the belt situation in boxing. It's talked about so much. Yes. And it, it's kind of good to get uh, another perspective of uh, how things are viewed. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate the interview. Nice meeting you. Ed, thank you very much. Take care.